Welcome, Jay, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today's the third Friday of the month, which means it's time for The Doctor Is In Q&A with Dr. Ron Weiss. He answers your questions that you've submitted in advance. He's not just a doctor, he's a farmer, hence the outfit. Please welcome <laughs> Dr. Weiss back to the show. What do you like better, being a doctor or being a farmer? Ah. Uh. Well, there, there is a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences. So I, I love both of them for their unique qualities. Their unique, great. Yeah. Well, and I have to tell you something. I love this outfit. You sure as hell better not come to this farm and start working in the field because we could never find yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, this is, this is where, this is if I want to be like incognito at, at, at farm right. days, I'll just wear this and I'll blend in, you know? Did right. I ever tell you about the time I actually got lost in a corn maze? I mean, it was hours and they basically had almost sent helicopters. Really? Yeah, they, they used to do this thing in L.A. at Woodley Park and it was like, it's like $10. And like the idea was to get out. Well, it's like... We couldn't get out like we were just, and I think this was even before cell phones. And it was like, it was the worst experience. So how, how were you actually found? Fun? I don't remember, but I, I, I think I don't. Charles, do you remember how they finally got us out of the maze? It was hilarious, though. You I weren't mean, dressed like an ear of corn, were you? No, thank goodness I wasn't. But I, I don't do I do do escape rooms, though, because there is a door. But I, I don't do corn mazes anymore. So okay. Yeah. Well, speaking of fruits and vegetables, the first question submitted was from Lisa. And she says, Dr. Weiss, how important is it to buy all organic food, fruits and vegetables specifically? I really can't afford it. Hmm. I can't tell you, Chef AJ, uh, how frequently I get this question. Um, uh, I would say at least once a month uh, in different arenas, I'm asked this question. And um you know, I, I think there are a number of different considerations. Um, I think the first consideration uh, when you want to answer this question is, um, is, is it important to get it compared to what? So I do believe that, um, that eating conventional fruits and vegetables and produce and grains uh, as long as they're whole plant foods, is far, far, far superior for your health than eating organic chicken, wild caught um, fish, you know, grass raised beef, hen, cage free chickens and eggs. It's far superior for your health. Uh, that's for sure. But um, I think. The issue is, is that once you get to a high level in your own personal health journey, um, it doesn't make sense to me to be paying so much attention to and, and focus every day on eating flax seeds and you know eating fresh vegetables and seeds and nuts and make sure we get our 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 uh, leafy greens in, Dr. Esselstyn, what does he now, up to five times a day, the dark leafy green, you know, doing all this stuff, you know, making sure we're not drinking perfluorinated alkyl substances in our water, filtering our water, maybe even getting reverse osmosis filter. But then the vegetables and the grains and whatever have glyphosate in it that cause cancer. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's, um, so for that reason, for personal health, I believe that, it, it, um, and now this is of course, um, notwithstanding the additional 20% cost that an average, um, average organic certified vegetable has attached to it versus conventional bears, uh, that you can afford it. I believe that you should should not eat conventional vegetables. Um, so I think an even more important consideration though is, and I move beyond this, even beyond what the concern is for our own individual health is, but it's the concern for what the production of those conventional foods did to our earth, because there it's, highly harmful to our mother earth using pesticides, 
monocropping and conventional farming methods. And quite frankly, uh, we don't have a lot of time left for our, um, our habitat here on earth. So to me, that takes the priority. So when someone asks, I know there's a long-winded answer, um, I can't afford it. The question is, well, who can afford it? Can our grandchildren afford to have one third of all insects wiped out 30 years from now? Can our great-grandchildren afford this because of conventional farming methods or no soil left at all? I don't think so. I think the costs are displaced uh, up front by us to future generations by eating conventionally produced foods. That having been said, I understand, you know, not everybody can afford good food. There are ways around it. And what I tell people is if you have, if you live in a house or something that has a backyard where you can grow your food, we know that enormous volumes of food can be grown organically in a backyard to support a family. Um, if you live in an apartment building or you don't even have a backyard, there are a lot of community gardens that are available where for a nominal fee, five or $10 a year, you can rent a space. Um, uh, if, you, if you are on a, a assistance, uh, SNAP assistance to help uh, bolster your uh, food purchases, there are many ways and in many jurisdictions where we can get double bucks back or increase the amount of buying power you have. And you can go get organic foods at a local farmer's market with that. So uh, those are my suggestions. So like, for example, with broccoli, which is one of my favorite vegetables, I notice a taste difference in the organic, like, especially if I buy it like at Trader Joe's, but certain things like a banana, I can't tell the difference is it's super important for something with a very thick peel, like a banana or a watermelon, where you're not eating the rind for it to be. Organic. Absolutely. Yeah. So things that tend to have coverings on them, fruits and vegetables, uh, they tend to have not as much uh, pesticide penetration into it. Uh, for example, like so sometimes because I we don't have uh, organic corn available and if it's the height of the summer, I will eat corn on the cob that was grown by a local neighbor of ours that grows it conventionally because studies have shown that that biocides or life killers or pesticides are a very low levels that enter the corn through the husk, even though they've been sprayed. Um, and melons are similar to that, right? Uh, avocados, like sometimes uh, I will buy not, uh, conventional avocados because they're, they, they don't, have, they have very little or no pesticide residue. Um, for your viewers, who are interested, you can go to the Environmental Working Group, EWG Dirty Dozen, go to ewg.org, and you can see every year they test the, the different crops for the lowest pesticide residue and the highest, and you can see which are your best deals to get to which vegetables, like for example, you would definitely, if you had limited funds, Chef AJ, You'd want to strategically plan your budget so you could, for example, let's say you want to get spinach, right, or kale, but you also want to get an avocado. Uh, spend your organic dollars on the spinach and kale. Do not get those conventional because they're flooded with dangerous pesticides, but do get the avocado conventional because it has no residue in it, stuff like that. And you can get those lists from ewg.org, Dirty Dozen. Perfect, thank you. Okay, well now on to some more medical stuff. And I like this question because it's general. So uh, it's not about somebody's specific blood test, which is hard for you sometimes to answer. This is from um, um, Rachel. What are your thoughts on mammography? Hmm. Wow, well, I like that question very much because I struggle internally with this myself. Uh, Huh. So, um, and by the way, uh, if people 
want uh, more background information on this entire subject of mammography and on how to best prevent breast cancer and treat breast cancer uh, on our website, um, on um, ethosfarmproject.org's website. And by the way, Chef AJ, we have changed our name. Uh, we've changed our name from Ethos Farm Project to Ethos Farm to Health. So it, it, you can either, you can use the old website, ethosfarmproject.org or ethosfarmtohealth.org. You'll see when you go under events for um, Breast Cancer Month every year, we have a wonderful presentation on all the facets of breast cancer treatment and prevention. And there's a big discussion on mammograms in there. Um, uh, you're welcome to subscribe to it. it. There's a $25 donation that's asked and that goes to support the farm. But uh, it's a wonderful presentation with Dr. Walter Willett, uh, who is uh, our, on our board emeritus. And he, he is uh, did a lot of the breast cancer research it, through the Harvard uh, Nurses Health Study. Uh, but getting specifically to the question, so mm -hmm. in medical school, one of the first classes they teach you is about prevention um, and the different forms of prevention. There is primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. What does all this mean? Well, um, primary prevention is the best kind of prevention that the doctor and the patient wants. And that's when you do not have a disease at all. And from, you know, step number one, you want to make sure you never get the disease. What we're doing and symbolized by that beautiful outfit you're wearing today, Chef AJ, by eating plants and employing lifestyle medicine, that is primary prevention, right? We eat these plants because we don't want to get a heart attack. We eat these plants because we don't want to get a breast cancer. And eating whole plant food diet is immensely powerful in, in preventing breast cancer and treating it, by the way, which you'll find out from the uh, webinar on our website. Nice. So I'll get, make sure you get me the link to that yeah. and I'll put it in the show notes. Those farm to health.org. Yeah, I'll, I'll have our staff send it to you. That would be fantastic. What is secondary prevention? Mammograms are secondary prevention. So what that means is I'm, I, I, I'm using a tool, in other words, a mammogram to find breast cancer that's already growing in me. But, um, I want to find it early enough so that I can save my life and hopefully get rid of it before it gets rid of me. That's secondary prevention. Um, tertiary prevention is I have breast cancer. I'm going to die of my disease or I'm, it's, I'm never going to get rid of it. And I'm doing something to prevent a, a worse outcome. For example, let's say I have metastatic stage four breast cancer. It's escaped all over my body, but there's a spot of it in my femur and my femur is going to fracture if I don't take care of this metastasis. Radiating that femur so it kills that spot, that would be a tertiary prevention. So as you can see, eh, are mammograms that desirable? Well, not as good as the eating the plants, but I guess it's if we could do the mammograms and we could actually demonstrate that on a population basis, they do prevent women from dying from breast cancer, that that would be a good thing. But guess what, Chef AJ? It's never been shown. So for years and years and years, people have been studying this, including probably the most um, valued or the most respected medical analysis committee in the world, the Cochrane Committee out of Europe. And they have found that breast mammograms 
have never prevented any women from dying from breast cancer, ever. And so, um, in fact, uh, mammograms, what we have found out is they, turn, they actually ident they cause more breast cancer to be diagnosed because when you do mammograms uh, 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 consistently across a population, there are women who have breast cancer identified in them from the mammogram who would have been all right. And if they didn't have the mammogram, it was a small tumor. It wasn't going anywhere. They wouldn't have ever known about it. And the mammogram and our, our, our advanced te technological expertise finds it and they turn into a breast cancer patient and undergo chemotherapy and mastectomies and lumpectomies. So that's the bottom line. Um, what do I tell my patients? I tell my patients to eat whole plant foods. Um, if I have a patient who is, since a girl is eating soy, whole soy products, and who has been plant-based all of her life, and uh, as an adult, uh, like for example, we have a, a person in our practice, Asha Gala, who has been plant-based whole foods at a high level since she was in her 20s. I've advised her not to get a mammogram because I believe that she is at such low risk to get breast cancer that getting the radiation from regular mammogram screenings would increase her risk of getting breast cancer. So for someone like that, I would advise no. But if you've been like you and me, Chef AJ, during our lives where we were eating cream puffs or Ritz crackers and cheddar cheese or whatever, hot dog, whatever we were eating during our life, you know, I, I usually go by the standard United States Preventive Services Task Force recommendation at this time. That's the organization that makes the standardized recommendations for prevention. And that is to get a mammogram every two years. Uh, it has been between age 50 and 74, and now they're considering lowering it to 40, I believe 40, but it's not completed yet, that recommendation. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Do Doctor. Do you have any specific follow-up questions to that? Because I um, know it's a complex see, issue. Um, well, um, Susan, comment. Thank you for speaking the truth about mammograms. Um, Karen says, I've been doing them every five years. People are saying, well, thermography is better, you know, just like lots yeah, of. Yeah, so thermography. Yeah, what do you, Ronnie I, says, what do you think I, of thermography? There's no, it doesn't, I wouldn't bother with that because there's no, there's no standardized evidence that shows whether it's good or bad. We just, there's no basis to make any conclusions from that. So I can't give you an answer. No, no doctor knows. Yeah. I don't get them. <laughs> I mean, I did. Here, here's the here's the scary part. Do you know that since I graduated medical school, Chef AJ, breast cancer, when I graduated medical school, breast cancer was diagnosed in one out of every 11 women in America. Now it's diagnosed in one out of every eight women in America. Isn't that, that's quite something. And that's because we've done more primary, we've done more secondary screening with mammograms and with other kinds of very intensive investigations, too intensive, right? Like with ultrasounds and constantly needling things and asking women to come back and having breast centers open up, right? That are constantly trolling for breast cancer screenings or, or MRIs of the breast. So we've intensified the mammograms have become more powerful at identifying tiny little things. So have the MRIs, so have the ultrasounds that perhaps would never take off or wouldn't have bothered the woman to begin with. Yeah. Anyway, you know how Dr. McDougall feels about this. I know. I know Dr. McDougall probably, uh, I have not spoken to him about this subject, but I, I bet you he would, and I don't want to put words into his mouth, but 
I, I, I'm, I'm going to feel that he's not a fan of Maverick. Not a fan. He, he, yeah. he was talking about the Cochran, Cochran. Uh, yeah. And you know, I think, I believe, I read it a while ago. I think the nation of Switzerland disbanded their recommendation. I believe it was Switzerland for getting mammograms for the population based on this information. Um, yeah. So. Yep. Well, I mean, that, to each their own. I mean, I'm not telling other people not to get them. And and just FYI, audience, you you need to be you know you need to be guided by uh, your uh, your medical provider's advice, expert advice. So, you know, discuss this with your primary provider. Right. Yeah, and we put that in the show notes. That this, this is the disclaimer. Yeah. So yeah. great. Well, you know, we were talking about this condition right before we logged on because so many people have it. And, you know, our beloved Hans Deal had it. And obviously, you know, he passed away. And this question is uh, uh, from Anne about AFib. And she said, it's been a year after my ablation and I've had no AFib. Do I still need to take Eliquis? Hmm. <laughs> well, you would think not. So uh, for, for our listeners who are not familiar, atrial fibrillation is in a regular heartbeat. Uh, it can often be uncontrolled uh, in its rate. Uh, and uh, what happens is, you know, you have a, I, you know, I'm a musician, Chef AJ, so I like to think of uh, um, orchestras and the conductor of an orchestra, which is similar to the SA node. It's, it's, a, it's a natural pacemaker or conductor that's buried inside your heart muscle. And from here, the impulse or the beat to which your heart works or pumps is generated, just like the conductor of the orchestra uh, generates the rhythm by motioning to the orchestra how to play. And in atrial fibrillation, unfortunately, there are short circuits of an electrical nature in the heart, and then all kinds of upstarts, you know, someone in the first violin section, a, a tuba player, a, a cellist, uh, someone in the timpani starts conducting the orchestra and, and making the heart beat in all kinds of uncoordinated uh, uh, rates or, or rhythms. So that's the problem with atrial fibrillation. And what ends up happening is the atria, which is the smaller chamber of the heart, um, doesn't effectively pump. And what can happen is it sort of quivers. Blood can pool in this quivering uh, uh, chamber, and then it can clot. And then the clot can shoot out of the heart, go to your brain and cause a, a devastating stroke. And unfortunately, that's what happened, I believe, with our dear Hans Deal, who was a paragon in the whole plant world. If anyone don't, if you, any of you don't know who he is, he was the founder of the CHIP, the health improvement program, which is was probably the leading program and first one in the, in in, uh, in um, uh, educationally to demonstrate on a data driven basis the efficacy of uh, adopting whole plant foods in, in an, from an educational sense. Um, so, in any event, um, he passed away recently, right? And he was a friend of yours. Really good friend, yeah. Like, good like, friend. And like I'm the very, very sad. You know, we honored him at ACLM this year, the American College yeah. of Yeah, were you there? It was a beautiful I ceremony. I was there. I was. He was a nice man. I'm, I I didn't know him very well. I met him a couple of times, but I'm very sorry it was passing. So uh, in any event, um, atrial fibrillation can lead to these clots being generated and that's why this young lady who answered the question is asking if she should continue taking Eliquis, which uh, which is a blood thinner that prevents clots from being formed. So there are ablation procedures. Um, 
There are other procedures like called the watchman where they put some device inside your atria, atrium, your cha heart chamber, which can prevent uh, the ablation obviously uh, gets rid, it's supposed to get rid of the atrial fibrillation. So ostensibly, if you do not have the atrial fibrillation anymore, then you don't need to take the, uh, the Eliquis. However, uh, it would be up to your cardiologist to determine how successful that procedure was. And um, if in fact, you, the cardiologist can prove that there, you are not having any atrial fibrillation at all, then I think the possibility after a while, maybe six months, it depends on the cardiologist a year, maybe you could go off the Eliquis, but that's up to the cardiologist um, because you don't want it. You don't want the AFib to arise again unknowingly or unwittingly and cause a blood clot. But I, so w supposedly, uh, yes, tentatively, if in fact, this was curative for you, then you could go off of it, but do not stop it without your cardiologist's permission. Right. Okay. All right. Here's a good question. It's on SIBO or is it SIBO or SIBO? Potato, potato. SIBO. Small SIBO. intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Great. This is from Sarah. Dr. Weiss, do you feel that treating SIBO requires antibiotics or is there any alternative treatment you recommend? So mm, SIBO, as I mentioned, stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, and it's, a, hmm, it's kind of a proposed entity. Um, and what we think may happen is that, um, you know, a lot of us on the program may be aware of the gut microbiome, which are trillions of organisms that inhabit uh, primarily our colon, which is the last six feet of our uh, GI tract. However, above that, we have the small intestine. And there are three sec separate sections to that. And as you go through the small intestine, uh, you know, in the beginning, there's really not a lot of bacteria in the duodenum. But as you get to the jejunum and then the ileum, the two latter parts, and closer to the colon, you know, of course, there are greater numbers of bacteria. Um, and um, uh, basically, uh, there are healthy inhabitants or in these ecosystems that that are associated with being healthy. Mm. And not only are they associated being with healthy, but they determine they are determinants of our health. Um, and what happens is there are bad actors that can establish themselves, within the ecosystem of the small, incest, uh, small intestine and certainly the colon, which could then change the ecosystem so that it causes clinical problems. Um, so that's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, can, can we prove that this exists? I'm, I'm not sure. The tests that, are, that uh, you'll find, some GI doctors do them in their office, uh, and I believe Dr. Michael Greger has a video on this, have been shown to be not, not valid. The, the data that we get from them uh, are, do not, uh, uh, are, are not uh, reliable in diagnosing uh, SIBO. And there uh, are a number of tests. The most popular one is can be where you exhale a gas, which can determine whether you have these uh, abnormal organisms growing in your intestinal tract. Um, so in any event, um, you know, you asked a question before, I'm gonna try to, always trying to look to see how we can relate health to agriculture, right? Chef AJ, you asked the question, what do I like being better, a doctor or a farmer? And here's where it's both because
Conventional farmers try to kill things in an ecosystem. Farmers are, good farmers are masters of, uh, of appreciation and re restoration and regeneration of healthy ecosystems. And because of that, we don't use biocides or killing agents to kill pests, right? Whether they be insects or whether they be weeds, what we do is we fortify the, the ecosystem that's there that needs to be supported. And then once the ecosystem is healthy, it can take care of and out muscle the bad actors in the ecosystem. So when I get a question like this about SIBO, I think exactly the same way about the small intestine that I do about our field where there's Canada thistle growing in a field of winter wheat. I need to increase the good uh, species in the field and then they will suppress the Canada thistle. We need to increase the good species in the small cyst in the small intestine so that they suppress and ultimately, you know, outrun the bad guys that are supposedly causing SIBO. How can we do that? Well, the first thing is stop taking stomach acid medicines because stomach acid medicines reduce acid which kills bacteria coming into our GI tract and seeding our, our intestinal tract, whether it be bacteria from the outside world or viruses, or whether it be either our own mouth bacteria. Our mouth bacteria, if it's not killed off by a pool of stomach acid in our stomach because we've suppressed it, it could potentially seed further down into our lower, uh, into our small intestine or, or colon for that matter. So get off stomach acid medicines. And then of course, eat a diet of whole plant foods that's highly diverse. Um, and that will uh, support, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, the, you'll be eating a lot of the different fibers that come into the um, the gut and that that is excellent feedstocks for the organisms that will create a lot of molecules that will benefit our ex ex ecosystem. So that's my suggestion. I would not take antibiotics because antibiotics are not discriminating. They will kill all kinds of bacteria how do we know which ones are they killing? Are they killing the bad one? Are they killing the good one? It's just like when I, sp if I were to spray an insecticide on the field, what, or what are you killing? What insects? Are you killing honeybees? Are you killing monarch butterflies? The answer is yes, killing everything. That's why we call them biocides. And I consider antibiotic biocides. I wouldn't take rifaxin. And by the way, there's no evidence that, as I said, according to the test, that SIBO is a real thing. Wow. That's interesting. That's a long answer. That's okay. Very interesting. So this one, I think you're going to like this question. I know Dr. Goldhammer would. This is from Danielle. And the question is, can dairy be the major inflammatory component in osteoarthritis pain? I'm plant-based, but was taking a little cheese sometimes. Once I stop, my life has dramatically improved. Chef AJ, I've had patients who are completely whole food plant-based, except they had a cup of coffee every day with a little bit of cream in it. Well, I mean, what could that be? A teaspoon or two teaspoons? They could not get rid of their osteoarthritis. They were on the schedule for joint replacement. And as soon as they cut out that little bit of dairy, all their pain went away. So yes, I'm in agreement with this young lady. I think you don't have to have a lot, but even a little bit of dairy, even a little bit seeps in, it's highly pro-inflammatory, especially to osteoarthritis. And here's the other thing I've noticed. Sometimes 
people who have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which is, it's not the same thing. It's also a joint arthritis, a joint inflammation, but this is autoimmune in nature specifically. It's a little different than osteoarthritis. I've noticed sometimes uh, even if they have periodically uh, some a little bit of dairy product, and especially dairy product, even more so than chicken or other kinds of animal proteins, that is just highly inflammatory to rheumatoid arthritis as, as well. So yes, please just stay away from all dairy products. Great, thanks. This is from Anonymous. I'm a 44-year-old male, BMI of 23. I'm on a whole food plant-based diet. I've been taking one capsule of Flomax, which is half a dose due to incomplete bladder emptying and poor urine flow. A urologist said that my symptoms are due to poor pelvic floor dysfunction and a mildly enlarged prostate. I've been doing pelvic floor exercises and stretches with some improvement. Is there anything I can do to get off Flomax? I've had an inguinal hernia for about five years. Is it possible that that is causing my symptoms? And how old is this gentleman? 44. Well, you know, he's on the, kind of on the young side for benign prostatic hypertrophy, although I, I think that is possible. I've seen, you know, men in their 40s with it. Usually we don't tend to see it until 50s or 60s in men. And that is BPH is when the prostate, uh, there are two major problems that men as they get older tend to have with the prostate. One is prostate cancer, which is the number one cancer in men by incidence. The, the other thing is, which is even more common, is BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. That is not cancer. It's just an enlargement of the prostate, which then obstructs a uh, flow of urine from the bladder above uh, the prostate outwards. So it sounds like this gentleman has mild BPH, you know, and he's kind of young, 44 years old. I'm, I'm sure it sounds like the, the urologist probably did urodynamics, uh, which are measurements of the flow of the urine. Like he checked to see if you were emptying your bladder. How, what, what was the residual of urine in the bladder? Were you leaving urine left over because it couldn't get out or, you know, there, there are measurements that can be taken of the flow and the uh, the the travel of urine in your system. And um, the bottom line is this. Uh, sometimes you may have a little bit of both, maybe some muscular weakness in your pelvic area, maybe also combined with a little bit of BPH. I'm excited that you are able to improve yourself with doing the pelvic floor. And if I were you, this is what I would advise. First of all, um, you know, most men complain of uh, frequency of urination from BPH because they have to wake up at night. It's usually not so bothersome during the day. Make sure uh, you don't drink or eat within, especially on a whole food plant-based diet, uh, for within four hours of going to bed. And that usually is a, a very effective in reducing nighttime urination. So I would make that suggestion to your audience member. Four hours, no eating or drinking um, to help further prevent nighttime urination. I would be consistent in my pelvic floor exercises and really work on those because it can take I've seen it take, uh, you know, you can get some benefit like in six months, but you, like going to the gym, you have to build up the muscles over many months. I would continue doing it. Here is the other thing you can do. Um, you can uh, eat, um, I believe it is a teaspoon of cranberry powder, organic, of course, organic dried cranberry powder, and a tablespoon of raw pumpkin seeds every day. I have had patients that have benefited their BPH from that. And the last thing you can do is just make sure you're eating flax every day, at least uh, two tablespoons of ground flax seed. Um, you can eat another 
uh, two tablespoons if it's cooked into muffins in a moist heat, because that will help, don't ask. It helps to decrease some of the cyanide that's in flaxseed. Uh, there are some studies that have shown that that amount of flaxseed consumption has reduced BPH and BPH urinary system symptoms in adults with BPH. Great. We all tuckered out with them. Uh, thank you. Yeah, those pelvic floor physical therapists, I've had quite a few on the show. They can really do magic. They can, especially with people who have overactive bladder, where your bladder, mu uh, your bladder muscles are not really well controlled. The pelvic floor is a series of slings, complicated intersecting planes of muscles and strengthening them up. And, and by the way, this is people talk about core muscles a lot, Chef AJ. These are intrinsic core muscles. Strengthening those core muscles are very effective. And I've often found that they replace drugs that patients are utilizing for urinary problems. Wow, that's great. Well, here's a question from Lisa. My OBGYN wants me to get a bone density scan. I'm a 52-year-old female, 117 pounds, at five foot two, strength train and exercise daily in very good shape. What is your opinion regarding this test? You know, Dr. McDougall would say, don't go looking. You'll always find something. I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in uh, I like the bone density test. You know, I'm not a big test taker. Uh, I don't like screening for things, but I like the bone density test because, um, so, you know, there was a, there was a, a recent webinar and I don't, this patient may have, I can tell the way she's asking the question. She may have been on this webinar that was given by Dr. Greger and it was all about osteoporosis. And the question is, well, only something like about 15 or 20 percent of all the fractures, the hip and the spine fractures that, that we have from osteoporosis are actually due to osteoporosis. The remainder is due to falling. So if it's only 15 or 20 percent, why are we spending all this time doing, doing um, all these tests to identify whether women have osteoporosis? Well, and, and why don't we just uh, give them exercises so their balance is better and their muscles are better? No. Um, well, uh, I can say that 15 to 20 percent of the fractures due to osteoporosis, that's not a that's not a negligible amount. So it's not like it's nothing. The other thing is that, you know, I think that the osteoporosis is a marker a systemic physiologic marker for other things that are not going right, like muscle mass and, and inattention to fitness and loading. And the reason why I like to do the bone density is I do it to inform the patient if there's a problem. And if there's a problem, then I institute with the patient a bone building program so we can we can get another bone density in the future to show that the patient has reversed the problem. And I think that knowledge of knowing, oh, okay, well, these exercises that I'm doing, those specific exercises are effective in building muscle mass. They are effective in reversing bone density that is worthwhile because a lot of the times it's, I think it's useful for patients to have demonstrations, right? That um, it's not just a screening test, but they're, they're enacting lifestyle behaviors to improve themselves. And this test shows they're improving themselves. So I, I, from that perspective, I think it's worthwhile. Well, if, if it's just about taking a drug, no, I don't think it's worthwhile. I don't, because the drugs don't really work. If your intention is to get this screening test and 
Chef AJ, Mm -hmm. they teach doctors, or at least they taught me in medical school. Before you order a test, don't order that test if you haven't figured out what you're going to do with the result after getting it. Mm, That's good advice. You should always know ahead of time, what are you going to do? So in this lady's case, if you're going to get this bone density and you're going to say, well, if it's well, if it's normal, what am I going to do? Nothing. You, you're not going to do anything. But if it shows osteoporosis, what are you going to do? If you're going to take a drug, I wouldn't end up getting it because the drug's not going to help you. And it could hurt you. However, if you're going to get the test and it shows osteoporosis or osteopenia, and then you're going to institute special exercises in a fitness program and get 60 grams of protein and whatever, and, fit, and then you want to check to see if you did a good job, I think that's valid. Well, we have another question about bone density from Andrea, and she wants to know, how do you improve it? She's 22, whole food plant-based. She strength trains three days a week, does yoga two days a week, and her bone density scan showed her total BMD is 1.020. My age matched Z score is negative 0.06, and my young adult T score is negative 0.06 have no idea what any of that i don't understand she's only in her 20s you said she's 22 well she shouldn't be getting a bone density test i'm not sure why why a bone density test is done we get it you know we expect the bone densities to be okay in 20 some odd year old women is is that i I get it when people when women are menopausal i would get i i have gotten it and i find them again I have found it clinically useful in women who want to enact lifestyle behaviors to improve themselves. Otherwise, I don't really find it useful. Was that a good score that she had? I don't know. Uh, the T, what was the T score? The T score. And how old is she? She's compared to like a 30 year old. She's too young. So I'm not sure. It's, I, it, well, she I, wants I, to know how she can improve it. Her T score is negative 0.06. Well, that's compared to a 30 year old woman or 25. That's normal. Mm-hmm. Negative. So, oh, it's negative 0.6. It looks like ne- negative 0.6. Yeah, that's normal. So with T scores, uh, nor- normal bone density, according, you know, uh, comparing to you to the rest of the population, is any value that's more positive than negative 1.0. So if this young lady is negative 0.6, it's within the normal range. Yeah. So it just has to be more positive than negative 1.0, and she is. However, Going forward, if she wanted to further improve it and didn't want to get uh, bone problems in the future, um, there are uh, actually this, I came across a study that was done in like 20 in women in their mid twenties, which showed that doing, it was a very small study, but it was interesting that, that young women doing um, jump squats um which, um, you know, maybe I could show you for a second. My office. Can you sh- see me, Jeff AJ? Oh, wow, yeah. yeah. So um, that would be something like this, where you get down, you, you squat, fling yourself up in the air, get down again, fling yourself up, and into a squatting position and do 10 of those repetitions. If you were to do them in this study three times a week, it showed a significant improvement in bone density after six months. So what I tell my patients is to do those, I uh, tell them to do them seven days a week. And it's only 10 of them. I mean, how, how long could it take a minute? or so, Uh, they're easy to do. I tell them to do them without sneakers, Uh, do them on bare feet on a firm floor because you want the vibratory forces when you land from that jump to go through your feet and to your bones, your femurs and your spine. 
Another thing my patients do is jumping rope. Jumping rope is a good one too. So the, the, the answer is jumping, jumping. Nice. I, I particularly like those jump squats because it helps to actuate the, all those pelvic muscles and the thigh muscles. You know, farmers do a lot of this in the field, right? They're squatting tending to, you know, weed and, and, and pick up things from the dirt, harvesting, planting. Cool. Yeah. Well, speaking of jumping, Richard can't jump because his knee is bothering him and he's done PRP, PRP, PT. He wondered about lipo gems. It sounded promising. Have you heard about lipo gems? I have not heard of it, but what is, did he, does he say what specifically is wrong with his knee? Well, Richard, he's texting me personally. So if you can get back to me as soon as possible before the show ends. There I'll are many things that can go wrong with the knee. Um, I, I'm, swelling. Guessing, I'm guessing. Swelling. He has swelling. I know, but we would need a diagnosis. PRP is usually used for tendinous problems. It's plasma rich platelets, plasma rich platelets. It's a, it's a process where, you, you know, you get a, a, a component of your blood that's spun in the office and they inject it. And a uh, physiatrist uh, who you're usually the doctors who do this, the rehabilitation or physical medicine doctors inject this and they like this technique. Uh, uh, they, they've noticed in general, most physiatrists I talk to say that it helps uh, tenderness structures. Uh, oftentimes what happens with the knee is Sometimes there can be cartilage tears or there can even be ligamentous or ligament ruptures. I'm not sure what this gentleman had. It could be osteoarthritis. He would need a diagnosis. Okay. Hey, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? Uh, so I'm going to, uh, we're going to our relative's house and uh, we're going to have a plant-based Thanksgiving. God willing. Who's doing the cooking? Uh, well, my uh, sister-in-law will be doing it, who is uh, newly plant-based. So we're gonna we're gonna see. Well, that's good. Are you bringing in? How about you? Um, I'm I've been doing a big one. I like just everybody's invite. Well, not everybody, but you know, a lot of people either they don't have a place to go or they don't have a plant-based place to go. So it'll be my first Thanksgiving in the new place, and I'm very excited. We'll be making yeah. a lot of stuff. I just well, said, do you have any one main like turkey substitute dish? Oh, or you know, I, I, mean, like a I, I, of different I tend to not do those just because I'm allergic to soy and they're, they're kind of expensive and they're full of salt and, you know, stuff. So what I'm doing is I'm making Drina Burton's uh, autumn loaf. It's a delicious recipe. You can get it online for free. But what I'd like to do is I like to make it into a cake. So whatever is the loaf on the bottom, then I put the mashed potatoes and then I put the cranberry relish. And so it's kind of like a cake. Wow. It's delicious. We already did the preview of it and everybody loved it. So it's, wow. a, yeah. And, and what did you say? What, it's whose recipe? Uh, it's her recipe from for autumn loaf. But I also autumn. use my own recipe for sweet potato burgers and just bake it into a loaf. And instead of using my normal seasonings, we'll use like poultry seasoning. And yeah, it's, it's delicious. But you got to have mashed potatoes and cranberry relish on the holiday, you know? Well, I can tell you, I, you know, we have a, you know, New Jersey is, it has been traditionally one of the top cranberry growers in the United States. And so there is a, we have a good supply of fresh organic cranberries. And, um, you know, I know the cranberry, the traditional cranberry sauce has so much sugar in it. Um, I, I've never personally made the uh, cranberry sauce with, I'm, I'm guessing I'm going to make it with uh, dates. Mm -hmm. That's how I soak the dates. Right. You don't even have to soak them. I'll send you my recipe. Oh my God, mine is so. Oh, could you send it to me, please? Yeah, if you have my book on process, it's in there. I'll just email it to you as soon as we get off the air. It's so. Oh, easy. it's it's on. Um, it's in the unprocessed. Yeah, box. and but I I put more dates than it calls for because most people like it sweeter. It's basically oranges, orange zest, dates, and cranberries. You do not need to cook it. It takes less than five minutes. Hence the name. You don't process. need to cook it. 
No, it's better. It's so good. And it's so easy. And people love it just as a dessert or. What do you do? You blend it up? Well, food processor. So here you go. Okay. Two oranges, two large navel oranges, zest it, get the outside off, put it in the food processor, peel the oranges, put the oranges in. I'm going to make this Tuesday for plant powered Metro. Then you take your 12 ounce bag of cranberries, or I mean, that's what size they are here. I know they're probably smaller or less. Mm -hmm. And then you zhuzh it up in the food processor with the S blade. And then you take your pitted dates and you can use one cup, two cups. It's just how much you like. Most people tend to like it sweeter and you're done and it's delicious. It's good on oatmeal. It's good on just everything. So it's it's, it's very easy. So you don't even cook the cranberries. Oh, you don't have to. That takes too long. What do you need all that jelly? I'm used to eating like cranberry. Like, like no, no. Try this one. It's so okay, good. I'll try it that. Takes less than five minutes, and you know, you can <laughs> all three ingredients. Okay, I mean, good. I mean, all three ingredients. You can get them at Walmart. Even it's not anything esoteric, and it's delicious. Everybody okay, loves. And it. as I told you, it's one of our favorite books when patients come in. Thank you. Your, your unprocessed book is on our coffee table. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Dr. Weiss. Well, happy holidays, and we'll see you before the next holiday for more wonderful. Q&A. Have a wonderful with- Thanksgiving, and everybody oh, in the audience, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, they love you, Dr. Weiss. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time for a wonderful plant-based cardiologist named Dr. Stephen Lowe, and he's going to be talking about lifestyle medicine and heart disease.